Welcome to the Photographer Academy and one of our webinars. I think you've got an exciting presentation all lined up for us. What have you got planned for us today? Um, it's going to be a photographic journey really, uh, Mark. It's going to be, um, a lot of people think I was born with a silver spoon when it comes to photography and I want to sort of show that it wasn't. I want to show the, 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 the trials and tribulations of Dave Wall Photo and how I got into the business and some of the key images that I've produced over the years. Brilliant. So you've been a photographer uh, as long as me, I think, isn't it? <laughs> well, longer than me or whatever. Yeah. Fair amount of time now. <laughs> it, it's it's quite funny. I was discussing with Stubbly uh, about Photoshop on the weekend, uh, and I realised how long we've been using digital, and it's kind of it just frightens the hell hell out of me when you think it's like just a couple of years old, isn't it? You know, I, I go back to 1995 with it, and uh, it frightens the hell out of me when you actually kind of look backwards. That's a long time ago now. A long, long it, time ago. Uh, yeah, very much so. Uh, yeah, I started in the days of scanning backs. So, absolutely. Good, good. good. Dave, uh, let's, let's not waffle anymore. I'll hand over the screen to you. Remember, guys, if you've got any quest questions, uh, remember to pop, uh, to pop those down onto the question panel. You should have that actually running through. We've, all, we've already got loads coming through. And, uh, again, we'll answer those we're going through. Remember, you can t uh, keep up with Dave uh, through davewallphoto.co.uk. We'll talk more about that as we get to the end. But uh, I'll just hand over the screen to Dave, and we'll get going with today's presentation. So let me just see your screen live, Dave. We can hear you. We can see you. Take it away, please, Dave. Cheers. No, no problem. Hi, guys. Um, thank you very much for tuning in. I really do appreciate it. Uh, this is my first ever webinar. Um, I do webcasts on a regular basis, but I've never done a live webinar before, so it's going to be uh, an interesting experience. And as I was just saying with Mark then, I want to sort of show you um, a few of my key images that I've created over the years um, that are special to me, not necessarily the most important images, not necessarily the, the best images, but ones that are important to me and my, that particular stage in my career, so to speak. And I want to sort of show people that often the road into photography, especially these days, is sometimes a rocky one, as it was for me. Um, but I, mean, I want to just sort of, first of all, all, sort of talk about a few of my past clients and my present clients. Um, I've got quite a good blue chip sort of client base. Um, my favourites are obviously Manchester United, being a huge United fan. Um, I do quite a lot of work for them guys. I photograph all their executive boxes that surround the whole of Old Trafford. And also my graphic panels actually span the circumference of the whole of Old Trafford. So that's a really big one for me, a really big coup. Um, and they don't actually realise that I would do the job for free. Just don't tell them if you don't mind. Um, and I also do work for quite a number of like other companies like JD Sports, Adidas, Swallow Hotels. I also do work for K&Co, which is an amalgamation of various UK catalogues like Great Universal Stores, Empire and K's, and also Little Woods. Now, the reason there are so many catalogues in there is Manchester in the UK as a photographic hub is very, very catalog orientated. It's where the vast majority of commercial work comes into Manchester is via these routes. So I thought I'd just include some of those. But remember, remember guys, that these clients are past and present and they took years and years to nurture. And they take a long time to get clients like this through the door. Um, I would always call myself primarily a commercial photographer. That's what I was trained as. That's what I've always been. But over the years, like everything, things have morphed. I am now a photographer, a commercial photographer, a portrait photographer. I do the occasional wedding if someone's got a gun to my head. And I also do a lot of training as well. I undertake probably 50% of my workload these days is actually training. And I do training for lots and lots of different organizations, as you can see coming up on your screen at the moment. I do work for the societies of the SWPP, Calumet, Fujifilm, Colour World, Photo Training Overseas, I do work for Sigma Imaging, the Master Photographers Association, the BIPP, the British Institute of Professional Photography, Colour Confidence, Jessops, Dixons, Harrods. I've also in the past done work for the Home Office, for local police forces and a myriad of top class professional photographers in the UK and abroad. And I'm sort of getting known as a trainer in Photoshop and Lightroom mainly, um, but that isn't only what I train. I do do a lot of other training courses on stock photography and 
studio lighting and small product photography, you name it, I'll train it. <laughs> it's as simple as that. And I've been quite lucky over the years that my work has been recognized by certain companies, if you like. Um, a few years ago, Wacom contacted me. They'd noticed my work on various websites, and they, they realized that I obviously used a Wacom pen, which, which I do. And they asked me to become a Wacom evangelist, which sounds a bit rude, actually, but I am now a Wacom evangelist, which basically means when I'm up on stage doing my thing, I tell people how good Wacom pens are, which is something I was always going to do anyway. Um, and I was very recently lucky enough to be asked by Adobe to become an Adobe community professional, which, again, is it's an invitation-only club, so to speak. And Adobe had seen all the work that I've been doing across the UK and abroad. And they invited me to become what we call an ACP, which is something I'm extremely proud of. Um, and like I was saying to Mark, people think that, you know, I've been doing this 25 years, and people think that it's been an easy road. And believe me, it really hasn't. I, I first left school, um, sort of my work history, if you like. I first left school, and I started working at GC, the General Electrical Company, as an, an electrician, believe it or not. And about three weeks before I qualified, I walked out, I left. My mum and dad were so proud. Not. Um, and then I decided at the grand old age of about 17 and three quarters, I would become self-employed. Selling baby clothes. Yes, baby clothes. Would you buy a baby girl off that man? You just wouldn't, would you? So that was extremely short-lived. And then I actually, by default, ended up teaching photography. I went on a YTS scheme to, to learn photography. And after three months, one of the lecturers actually left, and I ended up teaching it. And it was one of the best jobs I've ever had. I was teaching people with learning difficulties. I was teaching people with criminal records. I was teaching a myriad of different people, and we had such fun. Back in the days of film, it was all black and white. We rolled our own film because it was a government-funded scheme, and we had no money. We had a ball, one of the best jobs I've ever had. And one day, I went into work, and it was all closed up. The government ceased to fund us. So I decided I wanted to stay in photography, and what was I going to do? And I ended up, back at the beginning, I ended up as a studio assistant. Um, I learned how to make cups of tea and brush the floor. In fact, my actual interview for that first studio assistant job, I turned up at my A lot of other guy who owned the company, magically, this telephone rang, and he went, oh, excuse me, uh, I've just got to get this telephone call. He said, would you mind brushing up the floor? There's the brush. And I thought, oh, right. So muttered to myself for about 10 minutes, brushing the floor, going, this is rubbish, I'm never going to work here. <laughs> then he came back in, looked at the floor, and said, you've got the job. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you, you can follow instructions. And he it's funny how studio assistants these days don't unfortunately get that baptism by fire. I learned so much from that guy, it was unbelievable. He taught me how to use 5.4, 10.8 cameras, Polaroid, and trust me, Polaroid was expensive. You used more than one sheet, it came out of your wages. So I learned so much from that one particular photographer, and it all boiled down to learning how to brush the floor. And then I decided that the £67 a week he was paying me wasn't enough. <laughs> and I decided to work for Keith Johnson & Pelling, which is, um, it used to be, I should say, uh, an old pro dealer in across the UK. And I worked for KJP, and then it became Leeds Photo Visual. And I worked for Leeds Photo Visual, and I worked in their digital department. And then when Leeds Photo Visual got bought out by, you guessed it, Calumet, I worked for Calumet. So I worked for all the big boys, so to speak, uh, again in their digital department. From there, I got poached by Kodak, and I worked for those for a few years. Um, thank goodness I don't work for them guys now, unfortunately. And then from there, I worked for various colleges and universities, teaching everything from school kids up to HMD and HNC. And then I also worked at various photographic studios. But there was one particular photographic studio that was probably the most important to my career. And that was the one that I worked at just before I went self-employed. And that was a company called MDA in, in Stockport, near Manchester in the UK. And that was a 6,000 square foot studio. It was...
So why was it the most important? Um, it was the most important because we had, for the very first time in my career, our own in-house retouchers. And we had our own printing presses. I don't mean printers, I mean printing presses. The ones that you see in newspapers. So I got to learn about how to produce images that were good enough for print, CMYK conversions, how printing plates are made. So I learned all the pre-press side, which a lot of photographers still don't understand and don't know. But where it really shined for me was the retouchers. Now being um, a photographer, and I'm sure most of us photographers will agree with this, we are often, well we're prima donnas, let's be honest. We never make mistakes. So I was the chief photographer and studio manager and I had various other photographers working with me. And our retouchers in our, their own little dark cave attached to the studio were taking hours and hours to retouch all our work. And me being me thinking, but our pictures are perfect. Why are they taking so long retouching these per perfect images? And you have to remember this was in the days when we used to use scanning backs, which for the guys who would never seen a scanning back, it's basically a flatbed scanner attached to the back of a camera. So nothing could move within the image. And these were the days where our clients were people like Cadbury's. Now Cadbury's has a specific purple. And our cameras at that time were so primitive, very expensive mind you, but very primitive. We, um, we couldn't capture that perfect purple. It always turned out blue. So our retouchers had to change the color from blue to purple. So I sat in that office for month after month and watched them intently. And I watched them do all the little bits that they had to do, which was repair labels, get rid of moray, which was a real problem for us at the time. Because at the time everything was CCD chips, it wasn't CMOS chips, is what we use these days. And I watched them do all this fantastic work retouching things. And after these few months, I, I stood up one day and I went, right guys, I'm leaving you to it. And you could see a sigh of relief from them all. And the, one person said, why did it take you so long to think that we weren't pulling the wool over your eyes. I said, I just had to know. Um, then I walked outside and, and absolutely roasted all the photographers for taking bad pictures, and myself included, because I realized at that point that I know the phrase of get it right in camera, I don't always agree with, but the, the closer you get it, you know, we should be retouching for perfection, not retouching for correction. And that's where a lot of us these days fall down. And I'm, I'm a culprit of that still. Now, I want to show you sort of my first ever real retouch. And this retouch still sits in my portfolio. And I do cringe at it drastically. Um, because the first thing I look at when I see that image is, why have I put a reflection in the water? And the, the brutal answer is, I've learned how to put reflections in water, so I thought I might as well use it. But the reason it still stays in my portfolio, one, it's because it was the first big retouch I ever did. And the second is most people flick past it really quickly thinking, well, it's just a bottle of beer. Well, actually, it, it was a photograph of a cucumber, and then exactly under the same lighting, it was a photograph of Carlsberg Export with, for the labels. And then exactly the same spot, we popped the top, and the phone came out. And then I placed all of the images together. Now I look at that and I cringe because it could be done so much better these days. But you have to remember this was 10 years plus ago. This was a very, very long time ago. And it's still an image that sort of stands up today. That's why it's still in the portfolio. Um, and I just wanted to show you, you know, we all start somewhere. I started off, and like I said, I cringe. But it's an important image to me. Now, also while I worked at MDA, um, I produced my largest ever print. And it's probably from one of my worst ever pictures. This was a photograph of our assistant, Lydia. And the eagle-eyed among you might realize that there are no catch lights in the eyes. Now, that is it's not retouched, actually. Um, basically, we put lights behind Lydia. We fired them towards the camera. And the camera was hidden behind a huge sheet of white polystyrene with a hole cut in. That's why there's no sort of uh, reflections within the eye. So why did that particular image, which is pretty rough to be honest, why did it become the biggest print I've ever made? Well if you take a close look at this image here, this is a gas tower. And if you look at the bottom of the gas tower, they are full size billboards. So each of those eyes is about two and a half billboards in size. So that is just a massive print. But where this sort of the shock arrives is 
this was taken with the, the original Nikon D1, which was a 2.7 megapixel camera, just 2.7 megapixels, and it was blown up to two and a half times the size of a billboard. In fact, it's bigger, isn't it? Because that's just for one eye. So it's monstrously big when you look at it. And it's just something I want to sort of get across to people. I, like everybody else, love megapixels. I love them. I spend a fortune on them. But we don't necessarily need them. I mean, I recently did a job on behalf of Fujifilm. This was shot probably about 18 months ago. 18, yeah, about 18 months ago. And it was when the Fujifilm X-Pro1 first came out. And they asked me to do some seminars up and down the UK to show how good this new sensor was and this new camera was. And then I found out it was APS-C. Now, I've not shot with APS-C for years and years and years. And I thought, I don't fancy this. But I'll give it a go. They're paying me, so I'll do my job. So I took this picture, and I was absolutely gobsmacked. The level of detail that an APS sensor can see these days. And it brought me to believe that every camera that's out there now is amazing. We all crave and lust after shiny things, and then they end up on that shelf gathering dust, don't they? We've all been there. We all know it happens. But it just proves, if you look at the level of detail of that watch face, remembering that at this point in time we couldn't shoot RAW because we couldn't process it, that is a JPEG. And we blew it up seven foot wide from an APS-C sensor. It's not all about the megapixels. And we think it is, but it isn't. It's about how you use them. That's my honest, honest opinion. Okay, so things moved on once I, once I left MDA and I went on my own. I was very lucky that the first year I was self-employed, I won a Fuji Distinction Award, which was my first real big win. And a few of you will probably recognize that picture. It was plastered around in about 2003, um, absolutely everywhere. But the image wasn't actually taken for the competition. It was one of my retouches at the time said, I bet you can't make a black person white. And it was an absolute, just a pure challenge. And I show this image on a lot of my lectures, on a lot of my, um, a lot of my tours. And I don't show it because of the image. I show it for another reason. Every time I show this image, people say to me, show me how you did it. And unfortunately, at that point in time, when I thought I knew everything but I didn't, I did the work and I flattened it. Can I, the life of me, remember how I did it? No. I've got a good idea how I did it. But if I'd have kept the layered file, I could show people. And I could do days and days and days of lectures just on this. But I flattened it. And it was a mistake of mine. So that's one of the reasons I wanted to show this particular image. Just to say that, you know, at the time I had to flatten it. Hard drives were expensive. Storage was expensive. Now I flatten nothing just in case I make a mistake. It's one of the biggest things I teach on my Photoshop courses. I flatten nothing. So award-wise, that was 2003. In 2004, I was really, really extraordinarily lucky to get another Fuji distinction. And I, I still hold the record. I've got two. Nobody else has ever managed to do that. And again, this image is, wasn't shot for a competition because I don't really enter that many competitions. I was waiting for a model to turn up. And the white line in the front of that picture is a round fluorescent tube. And this was shot many years ago on a Canon 10D, so you can tell how old it is. And I was waiting for the model to turn up, and I thought, oh no, what happens if there's not enough light? So off with the top, jumped in, took a self-portrait to see if there was enough light to be able to photograph the model, and it ended up winning me a Fuji, Fuji Distinction Award, which are, you know, really big accolades in the UK. Now that actually wasn't, they weren't my first ever awards though, my first ever wins. I, I was so excited, I think it was about 1991, I'm not 100% sure, I won a practical photography magazine competition. And I won a Minolta 7XI, so again you can tell how old it is, and um, I was a Minolta user so I was over the moon. I got a day's shoot with the amazing glamour photographer Jeff Howes and an absolutely gorgeous glamour photographer who was the best in the world at the time, Joe Guest. So it was one of the best prizes I've ever received because I got to meet, you know, the gorgeous Joe Guest with no clothes on, which is always a bonus. 
the amazing Jeff Howes and, and a camera I absolutely adored. So it was really, really good win for me. And it really enthused me to carry on in photography. And this was the stage where my dad, bless him, used to say to me, Dave, you're never going to make anything in photography if you shoot pictures like this, the one that you've got in front of you now. Because I've always had this weird niche of I like what I like and I'm going to shoot it regardless. And that is why I've been lucky because it's worked. And for a lot of people it doesn't. Now more recently, I won Commercial Photographer of the Year at uh, the Society's Convention for this particular image, one of my own motorbikes. Something like 55 exposures in about 97 layers, something like that. Um, it's the way I tend to shoot products. I like people to look at products when they see my work and go, oh, how's he done that? And that's the way I like to work. I like to create the impossible. Um, and again, that was shot with the Fuji X-Pro1. Again, it was shot for Fuji itself. But all of those accolades, for me personally, completely pale into significance, insignificance, I should say, compared to this image. Now, it's not the image that's of interest to me. It's the circumstances that surround it. I was asked many, many years ago to give an image for charity auction at Bonham's Auction House in London. Uh, and I went down with my wife to the charity evening. And the reason I became a photographer was the late, great Bob Carlos Clark. He was the only reason I ever became a photographer. He was an absolute hero of mine. And I can say that this image sat on the same wall in the same auction as a Bob Carlos Clark image. And nothing will ever, ever top that. It is my biggest buzz I have ever had, was just to be on the same wall as Uncle Bob. You know, so that, that's my biggest sort of accolade. But as I said earlier, I will always call myself a commercial photographer because that's what I was trained to do. And I run a lot of different training courses on commercial product photography, small product photography. And I like to show people my style. And my style these days is very, very simplistic. Now, when I say simplistic, I mean the image may look simple, but it may have 12 or 14 lights on it. But I've also changed the way I like things over the years. I, I don't use a lot of flash anymore because for small products, all the flash outfits that are out there are just too big. So I use LED lighting. And this is a live um, seminar that I do for this particular shot. We shoot this live. And this is shot with a grand total of three watts of light. Three one watt lamps. Just to show people you can shoot things this good for pennies. And as long as you put the effort in, the images can look absolutely beautiful. And they can stand on their own. Now, talk kind of sort of simplistic stroke, not simplistic if that makes sense. I did an article for Photo Pro magazine, which I believe Mark also does articles for as well. And I was reviewing the Sigma SD1 camera when it was first launched. And this is one of those images that was actually shot with flash, but it was a nightmare, um, which you can possibly imagine. It's on Perspex, which is a dust magnet. It's a Perspex speaker, which is a dust magnet. It's symmetrical, which makes life very difficult. And that, I don't know why I decided to shoot this. I could have shot something so much easier just doing a camera view, but I never like to do anything half-hearted. So I decided to shoot this with the SD1 to show its quality. And again, it's that simplistic look, but one of the most difficult lighting scenarios you can ever come across. And just to make it a Dave Wall special, to Dave it, as I like to tell people, I dropped in my goldfish. Not literally, obviously, but I put them in within Photoshop later. Just It just reminded me of a goldfish bowl, so I just thought I'd do that on one of my seminars for a bit of fun. So even though I call myself a commercial photographer primarily, I wouldn't say it's my passion these days. I still enjoy doing it. I do. I love it. I love the challenge of that. But my passion these days is a niche market that I've managed to infiltrate and hopefully dominate which is book covers. I, I work with a library, an amazing library called Archangel Images, and I create these images and they get made into book covers, crossed fingers. What do I mean by crossed fingers? This type of photography is extraordinarily risky, but because I've got a really good client base, it's not that important to me, the cost implications. Um, 
for me, the reason I do these now is because it keeps me fresh. It keeps me interested. I feel like a student again, being honest. I shoot what I want, when I want, how I want. And I make money from it. The risk comes in is when I say to myself, right, I need to go to Venice for 10 days. I have to pay for everything, absolutely every single last bit of it, be out of my daily business for 10 days, come back, process them all, get them all retouched, and then hope they sell. There is no guarantee. It's extraordinarily risky. But for me, if I could shoot these and do nothing else, I would. Because I get to travel, I get to photograph what I want, and I get to retouch them within an inch of their lives. And the agency I deal with are just the greatest. I absolutely adore them. I get on very, very well with them. And this is absolutely my passion. And there aren't many niches in the market anymore. And it's just one I've, I've managed to find. So I'm, I'm very, very sort of pleased with that. Now, a lot of people actually know me more from my retouching rather than my photography. Because a lot of my photography, like the book covers, they, they go... Um, unseen if you like you know they're on a book cover it's weird you tell people you photograph book covers and then they go oh because they just think they materialize by themselves and no one ever looks at who took the picture on the back so people know me for retouching because of the many seminars that i run on retouching and um, so a lot of pe people know me more for that than anything else but it's it's a slight misnomer really um i mean if you look at this image here it, it does look retouched so with an inch of its life now, actually, there is actually minimum retouching on that image. And a lot of people don't believe me, but most of that is the processing in Lightroom that has done the work. The main retouching is just the neckline. If you look at the neckline, it's symmetrical. It was copied and pasted from one side to another. Because I'm a product photographer, symmetry is important to me. And unfortunately, I can't even break that mold when I'm shooting people. So. That's why I like symmetry in people. But people just think I Photoshop everything. That is 99% Lightroom. It's just about the processing. And again, this next image is one I show on a lot of my seminars. And people go, oh, that's been daved. That, that's had loads of retouching. Again, it actually hasn't. That was shot in black light or UV light. And the guys will know this light. When you're in a nightclub, we love it because all the ladies' bras glow white. Okay. That's the type of light that that's been shot in. So we, I photographed um, a model called Florida, who's a black model. And we gave her white eye makeup, white lipstick, and made her wear a white top. So anything that's white in those lights glows white. So that's what you get that glow. And the speckles on her cheeks are just plain and simple talcum powder. That's all it is, talcum powder. So it glows white. Now, the orange glow within the image, orange pink glow, is just tungsten lights. It's just the modeling lamps off the studio lights. And to be honest, that was an accident. I just noticed it happened to happen. So I left them in there. So the only real major retouching on that image is a couple of straight pieces of talcum powder, and I evened up the two pink flashes on the eye. But people just assume because it's me, there's lots of retouching in there. It's not always the case. Now, I could say that about this one, but I've been lying. This is um, a day session that I actually do on how to retouch people. Because, yes, it looks a nice image. This must have been shot so long ago, because this was shot on film and scanned. So God knows how many years ago this was, because I haven't shot film for donkey's years. But yes, it looks a nice image. But when you look at the original, you realize actually how much work has been done. Now, if we put them side by side, it's a phenomenal difference. Now, before anyone texts something to Mark now saying, what does Dave think about retouching people? Should he retouch them too much? Should we not? Dave's morality this, Dave's morality that, because I get asked this all the time. Look, guys, I'm as shallow as a puddle. If people pay me to retouch it, I will retouch it. It's that simple. Um, this is a professional model. She knows she's going to be retouched. She knows the consequences. Now, the sad thing about this is the image on your right was the original image. Remembering that this girl was chosen by an art director specifically for her looks. And when I got the brief of, can you retouch these items, I asked, well, why didn't you just choose a different model? You're changing her completely. And politically incorrect as this is, the art director said to me, 
I fancy my chances. That's the truth. Okay? He fancied his chances with the model and then asked me to completely change it. So if you look at the legitimacy of that retouch, around the top of a hair, all the little stray pieces have been tucked in. That's fine. Okay? A little bit of the hairline has been tidied up. The skin colour has been changed slightly. It was slightly red off the scan. The eyebrows have been plucked and shaped. The eye makeup has been altered. The specular highlights in the eyes have been altered also because it was shot with probably about 11 or 12 lights. The nose has been completely changed. The mouth shape has been changed and closed. The chin, as you can see, has been massively changed. Because no matter what we did, she had quite a square chin. Even bringing her chin down gave us that, still that square look. Her ear has been tucked in. Her necklace has been pushed in. And the bone on the top of her shoulder has also been pushed in. So, lots and lots of retouching on that. And that's sort of more what I'm known for. Because not only do I retouch my own work, I retouch other photographers' work. Other professionals, I do lots and lots of retouching for them guys as well. And a lot of the magazines and newspapers. What else keeps me fresh then? I have a, I have a, a new project on the go at the moment that again was sort of started by default. So my ongoing projects, I did an article for, again, the Photo Pro magazine. And it was on flash triggers. So I got my brother-in-law to model in a tutu, as you do, with a Havana cigar, as you do. We stopped the traffic for 45 minutes, which was hilarious. And he's game for anything, my brother-in-law, and he's a cracking model. He's fantastic. And this was, I thought, do I just shoot flash triggers? No. Let's have some fun. Let's do some really funky stuff. So I did this. Now, Scott has got three children. So they've all seen these images and they've all said, can we not do it? So I thought, okay, how am I going to do this? So I got my three-year-old nephew, who is absolutely fantastic, little Jack, and we photographed him. And we had to bribe him, so we got to keep the headphones. And uh, we whacked him about a bit. No, we didn't. The, 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 the bruise is, um, is, is put in later. And we wanted to just give him this, this complete attitude because he gives you this look like his big brother when he's annoyed. So we thought we'd do this attitude. And he is really a diamond geezer, as it says on the image. And I made this into a t-shirt for him. And I made it into a t-shirt for me, because I use it on my seminars. And people have said, well, how did you do it? And you know, it was so, so simple. We put studio stands in front of him, so we got his arms the right height. I pushed one hand in, my brother-in-law pushed the other hand in. And then we made his fists bigger, Flipped one fist to the other, so we got symmetry. Sorry, that's me again with my commercial work. And then we added the tattoos. The tattoo on his chest was actually a sweatshirt my brother was wearing at the time, so I just took it off and put it on. So that was Jack. Now, after Jack was done, his big brother, who's nine, said, well, what about me? Now, this one we could have really got in trouble for. This was shot 9 o'clock at night in Morrison's car park, underneath a security camera, I might add, if you can see it at the top of the image. Now, young boy, bare chest, rifle, 8 o'clock at night, dark place, was asking for trouble. And we didn't get anyone coming round, which was really good, because it was all legitimate and above board. But we just wanted to make him into a hunter, so I hired the rabbit's head. And again, that was made into a t-shirt for him. I just like this offbeat stuff, it keeps, me, it keeps me fresh. So I thought to myself, okay then, I need to sort of take this a little bit further. So I found an old image of me. And I decided to retouch it. The left-hand side is obviously the original one. And if you notice, it's that same um, fluorescent ring. And it was from that same shoot from the, uh, the original Canon 10D that many years ago. And I was inspired by the Mexican Day of the Dead. So I decided to do a little bit of Photoshop work on it. And sort of, that's it. <laughs> um, a little bit weird, a little bit funky. But that's the sort of style that I'm sort of following these days to keep myself fresh. And just a couple of weeks ago, I decided, I, had, I don't know why, I had a dream that I wanted to see, I have some weird dreams, that I wanted to see Darth Vader in pink underwear. So, I don't know why I thought that. So I decided to bring the model in and start playing around with this idea. Um, it's a very simple photograph, but with lots of Photoshop work. So we did Vader Raver, Darth Vader in a rave. Um, and the reason I chose this model is the tattoo across her chest is, says family. And Darth Vader is very much the whole thing about Darth Vader and Luke is the family connection. 
So she actually does have this real tattoo that says family. So we did the Vader Raver type thing. And then I wanted to, I thought, I thought of the idea of Saturday Night Fever. So I had a look at the poster and I made my interpretation of it, which is Saturday Night Vader. Now in the original poster, it's a mirror ball. Now I couldn't use a mirror ball, that'd be boring. So I created the Death Star in Photoshop. And we've got to do in the same pose, but with some headphones on, with the Death Star. I've added all the galaxies and the smoke, etc. And I've just sort of took it down a completely different route, just for fun, just to keep me still excited in photography after 25 years. Because you do get into a rut, you know, you get bored. And these sort of things are what sort of keep me fresh and happy and excited about photography again. And I've got a couple of really good model shoots coming up this week, tomorrow and Friday, of medieval costumes for my book covers. So it's all good at the moment. I'm really enjoying photography again. Because I'll be honest, the last five or six years, I got bored. I got very, very bored. Um, then I found out about the Fuji X series, and it's got me really into photography again. It's light, it's compact, and I move around, and I do all the stuff I want to do again. So I'm back into it again. I, I feel like I've sort of recaptured my mojo, so to speak. So guys, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, it's sort of a, just a little snippet of my photographic career, what's happened to me over the years, um, and how it sort of progressed, and its ups and downs. So, so that's sort of me for a, a few minutes, and I'd like you to pass it back, back over to Mark, if that's okay. Are you there, Mark? I'm loud and clear. We've got loads of questions coming through uh, through here. Thanks so much. Uh, I, you know what? I never. Re let me just steal your screen back. Uh, by the way, let's just read that out in case you're very small on a mobile phone watching. You can get in touch with Dave um, at uh, DaveWallPhoto.co.uk. That's D-A-V-E-W-A-L-L-Photo-P-H-O-T-O.co.uk. And then it's the same with uh, PhotoTraining.co.uk on the end if you want to actually see, kind of uh, see some of his training. I'll post this on the Facebook page anyway. Fingers crossed we can twist his, his arm as well and we'll get him actually doing some stuff for us on the Photographer Academy. It'd be great to actually see some of his amazing kind of digital tech, the techniques as well. Let me steal your screen back, Dave. I will post your email address, uh, sorry, your website address actually onto the bulletin board now in a minute. Let me just uh, freeze that first. Um, okay, let's go in with the first question, if that's okay with you, Dave. Stock photography. Oh, cool. Um, yes. Stock photography. Can you go into that a little bit more? Um, there's quite a few questions on stock photography. Um, one specifically is a photographer who predominantly was a stock photographer, but he's found over for the past two or three years now that the stock, that the stock sales are slowing down to an almost stop. What's your thoughts on that and any advice and things? Yeah, no, it, it's a strange one. Um, if you are what I would call a standard stock shooter, which is what I would call little Johnny kicking a ball on a beach or a travel stock photographer, then yes, um, things have slowed down drastically. I still think there is a market there, but there are certain agencies out there who I sh shouldn't name, but I'm not going to name, um, who have slashed the prices ridiculously. I've been very lucky that I'm in um, a specialist stock market, and the reason I'm in a specialist stock market is no one else would touch my work with a barge pole because it's too... It's too out there. Um, you've just got to reinvent the way that you work and also look at the agency that you're with and you've got to look and, and say, are you happy with the split that the agency give to you? And if you're not, you need to look around. And the best website to look for stock agencies is BAPLA, B-A-P-L-A. Um, and they have all the biggest agencies out there. But for your standard stock, yes, um, it has slowed down. What I say to people is find out what your passion is and absolutely go hell for leather at that one area. So let's just say you live in the Cotswolds and you absolutely love the area and it's all thatched cottages. Absolutely hammer it. Play to your strengths, not your weaknesses which is what a lot of the stock photographers do. They play to the weaknesses. They shoot things because they think they should. I'm a firm believer if you love something, photograph it, and that quality will shine through. Mm. It's just that uh, the, the one guy has actually just replied, replied now. He's seen an, in, an income drop from 120K a year to 20K a year. 
that's how drastic it's been wow. over the past three years. And he says, my photography isn't the, uh, the usual stock. If you don't mind me chipping in for a minute, I would say, really just go and have a look. If the agencies you're using, um, I, I would just go and have a look what is selling then and kind of actually just do a bit of a comparison. Uh, it's pretty much what Dave was saying. I think uh, just stepping outside of your own box at times is really good 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 for you perhaps I'm a bit, bit of a break from the normal uh, nor normal and just trying a different train in other words step off one pl platform and try another one kind of thing with it but uh, yeah that's a huge drop that is that's that's uh, thanks thanks for sharing that as well coming because it's it's tough out there you know we all we all know it's tough it's it's not all kind of glo uh, glory days by any means kind of thing no. with it um, okay <laughs> we had quite a lot of discussion going on, on the board it was that's why I had to switch off my um, my microphone, because you would have heard me tap my tapping away like an Id idiot. In fact, Ado Adobe Cloud was a big discussion going on on the question board. <laughs> oh yeah. no! And I know you're kind of associated with them, so um, I'm obviously kind of trying to be polite and honest with it. But <laughs> I'll keep it as, sim as simple as I could put it. All right, Adobe yeah. Cloud in the in the future of photography, good or bad. Oh wow, that's right putting me on the spot. That is. No, I, I can't um, do yeah. it any other way because if you saw the questions no. going through, Dave, honestly, no, wait, wait, you would no, straight no. me up. I, I, yeah, no, absolutely not. I mean, I um, I have my reservations about the whole idea of it. Um, it's a really, really tricky situation. I think I think people have to look at it from both sides of the coin. That um, I think that Adobe Cloud, most people renew their, let's say just say Photoshop for the sake of argument, renew their Photoshop every second or third edition, which is good for photographers, but it's not really good for the revenue stream of Adobe, because they're not getting regular business, they don't know where their cash flow comes from. So I can understand why Adobe have done it, because they're getting cash flow, and they're getting regular people, um, and they're trying to combat this issue of piracy, because I still unfortunately go to a lot of studios where I do one-to-one -one training where it's pirated software. Um, and I, it's just, if it's your business, it's not something you should be doing. Even if it's not your business, it's not something you should be doing. So I understand why Adobe have done it. Um, I honestly feel that maybe in the future this Adobe Cloud subscription, etc., will maybe morph into something more cost-effective, user-friendly, whatever it might be. I think this is the beginnings and I think it will change over time. Uh, I, I was very, very against it when it was first announced, but I'm trying to be pragmatic and look at both sides is the honest answer. Um, it's a tricky one. It really is a tricky one. I think the pricing's wrong. That's my honest opinion. I think the pricing is quite expensive. Um, but you can understand Adobe that they want people to buy things every year. Who wouldn't? If, if our customers only bought every three years, we'd be a bit worried. I'm sure Adobe were in the same situation, Mark, to be honest. Yeah, pretty much. Sorry for putting you on the spot with that one, but as I said, I had so no, many... No problem. I had so many... As, as soon as you said that you were involved with Adobe with it, it lit up on the question board like you wouldn't believe with it. <laughs> um, anyway, we'll come back to Do Adobe now in a minute. Um, Arc A... Arc a angels and covers and things. Is that something um, that anybody could actually submit to? Is a quest a, yes, que they, a question or is it selective? Yeah, no, 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 no. What you can do, um, like any picture library, you need to go on the actual website itself and look at the submissions page, and it will give you the indications of um, what resolution they require, how to send a submission in, and what Archangel will do then is basically you send a. a um, a contact sheet of images and Archangel will look at them and go yes you're for us or no you're not for us um, <coughs> excuse me and then once they've accepted your first submission whenever you, whenever you new, have new work you send it into them they cherry pick what they want and they or it's a bit, a bit scary when you hear the phrase 50-50 because you get 50% the agency get 50% but trust me, compared to places like iStock Photo, where they get 95% and you get 5%, 50-50 is a heck of a good deal. So you just follow their instructions, send them an email, please mention my name, that's absolutely fine, I'm very good friends with them. In fact, I think I was one of their very first contributors, so I know them extremely well. Follow the instructions, and if your work's good enough, trust me, they will take you on no problem whatsoever. 
Brilliant. Thank you. Um, okay, just just before we go back to Photoshop for a minute, um, Blacklight. Can you explain that a little bit a bit more uh, more again? They understand that uh, it's what you get in night clubs. Can you just talk uh, talk about the tech uh, the technique a little bit as far as exposure is concerned? How it kind of responds to digital imaging and so on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, it was complete trial and error, to be honest. Um, the black lights I bought were just black light fluorescent tubes, and I bought them from the local retailer Maplins. Um, the problem with black lights isn't really about exposure and the way that you use it. It's that it just doesn't kick out a great deal of light. So what I ended up doing was surrounding the model with lots of white material, polystyrene boards, and I tried to bounce as much light off those, off the light strips as possible, just to try and amplify the light. So you've got to work on high ISO, leave it on auto white balance, and literally that is the effect you'll get straight out of camera. And if you want to add some warmth, just use a modeling lamp um, on your studio lights and you'll get that lovely warmth. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, let's jump back um, to Photoshop for a minute. Um, smart objects, uh, do you use them much now? Because you mentioned, um, it ha all, all the questions came through on this, when you were talking about you don't flatten images anymore. Um, obviously, smart objects has really changed the, the kind of the face of layers over the past year and so on. What's your thoughts on that? Yes, I use smart objects all the time. Um, I have used them more and more over the last probably 18 months or so. I, I like the idea specifically, <laughs> hopping back to Creative Cloud, I, I specifically love the idea of um, merging all my layers to the top, creating it to a smart object, and then being able to go back into Adobe Camera Raw and add things like clarity, etc. Come back into Photoshop, and if I need to, I can go back and just readjust that at a later date. So smart objects for me are a really big part of the workflow. The only downside is the file size has just become really bloated. But hey, hard drives are cheap. That's the way I look at things these days. I mean, some of my images are three, four, five gigabytes per image. Mm, brilliant. Um, you mentioned ACR there, so I might as well actually jump into that now. Lightroom versus ACR. Lightroom all the way. Um, I have a, an analogy for ACR and, and, and Lightroom. A lot of people used to say to me they're the same. Um, what I would say to people is, yes, the processing engine is the same. However, Lightroom is a digital asset management system. And, um, sorry, ACR is, and Bridge combined are just a file viewer. So I say that one is a happy elephant and one's a goldfish. So Lightroom's a happy elephant. In other words, it never forgets anything. It introduces itself to every image. It remembers where it is. It remembers everything about it. Whereas Bridge and um, Adobe Camera Raw, it'll open a file, introduce itself to an image, and then forget it as soon as it goes out of that folder. So you're losing lots and lots of functionality. So Lightroom is, has got more finesse when it comes to the slider bars, so to speak. It's got a lot more finesse, but Lightroom for me, I've got 360,000 images, and I can find any image in any folder, in any hard drive, in less than 15 seconds, and get Lightroom to open that folder in that hard drive and direct me to the image in 15 seconds. So they're a world apart, Lightroom all the way, Mark, definitely. Is that in a um, image management, though, or in the, in the actual process of, of the file itself? That's well, the for, for, the, yeah, for the image management, definitely. For the processing of the file, the results can be the same, but Lightroom just has more finesse about it. Um, everything about it just is that little bit further advanced. It's more user-friendly. You can get exactly the same results, but you can achieve them quicker with more ease with Lightroom without a shadow of a doubt. Cool. Um, okay. Uh, do you use any presets in Photoshop or Actions or anything? I use a collection of my own Actions. Um, I've recently, because I've done a review on them, um, been using the VSCO uh, presets in Lightroom, which are sort of a set of presets to mimic Velvia and Astia and all those things. And they, I have to say, amazing. I tried doing these myself years ago and got bored very quickly. These guys have spent I don't know how long perfecting them. 
and the VSCO actions are fantastic, I've got to say. In general though, I'm usually disappointed. Um, I mean, I do use on one software and I use Nick software occasionally as well, but I'm usually disappointed with a lot of actions and presets, so I tend to make my own a lot and like I say, use the VSCO. They're the main ones that I use. Cool. Somebody's uh, looking to step away. We've got about six six minutes left left here, so we should be able to do the questions. Um, somebody stepping away from commercial photography because they've got a problem with uh, clients paying bills and everything else. They, even though they've been a commercial photographer for close to twenty years, um, any advice? Kind of jumping ship into the likes of what you've been discussing today, as far as stock is concerned, going into special projects. Uh, yeah, yes. Um, I feel sorry for the person who's obviously asked that question because I'm in exactly the same situation as of yesterday. I've got a client trying to bounce £2,600 worth of retouching on me, so I know exactly where they're coming from with the commercial world. Um, my advice is do what I did, uh, which was keep the commercial as long as you can to fund your way into, say, let's say the, the, the stock photography side, because the stock photography side takes 18 months to two years to bring in any income whatsoever. So I, for example, did my commercial work and weddings just to fund my trips abroad to do the stock. Then when stock paid for itself, I could phase the others out. It's an unfortunate fact of life, but you're going to have to do some things you don't want to do just to fund that 18-month gap. It's the only way around it, unfortunately, Mark. Okay. Uh, do you have a link for Archangel at all? And how uh, did you spell it? It is, yes. It's hang on, weird, hang on, actually. hang on. I've got to find the question again in a minute. So, www. <laughs> it's A R C. Yep. A N G E L. Yep. Hyphen images dot com. Uh, imi hyphen images dot com. I'll send that out to you all. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. So it's Archangel Images, but without the H, because a lot of people put Arc as in Arch. Yeah. No, I'll send to all, so anybody who wants that, they can have that as well. Remember, I posted out uh, Dave's website and things, really, you'd be able to get in touch with him to any training or kind of advice or whatever else, kind of, kind of check up on that. Uh, okay, we did the presets. One, okay, Lightroom, we're back to that. One catalog or separate catalogs per job? Aha. <laughs> I get asked this all the time. Um, Lightroom was designed to use one catalog only. So if you organize the way that you work correctly by using um, the folders and collections the way that they should be used, then one catalog all, all the way. Can you explain about the difference in catalogs and everything else? Because that way who... you can find any image with it. It was never designed for multiple catalogs. Cool. There we go. Hope that helps you. Uh, okay. Uh, with the big files you are pro uh, producing, what processor do you rec recommend to avoid too much slow the slowing down in processing speed? Any advice on that? Okay. It's it's not always yeah. It's all not always about the processor, unfortunately, Mark. Um, I would say for anyone who's doing very large files, it's about as much RAM as your machine can hold and try and fit a solid state drive in there just for your Photoshop work. They are the biggest um, ways to speed up your machine, not necessarily processor. If you're looking for processor, you're going to be looking at something like an i7. And RAM and everything else, isn't it? It's a whole combination of things. As much RAM as you, yeah, as you can. You want, you want 16, 32 gig, whatever you can squeeze in. Yeah, yes, as much as you can squeeze in there. Uh, cool. Hope, hope that helps you. Um, what is the URL for the... Bapler or Dappler? What was it again? You mentioned Bapler. Bapler. It is. I'm guessing. I'm could be probably slightly wrong on this, but it's www. Yeah, b a p l a. Yep. Dot. I think it's dot org, but I'm not 100 percent sure on that one, Mark. Okay, I'll put. I think on the end. <laughs> um, that I won't put. Dave thinks. I said to you. <laughs> so that'll. It's dot org. Dot com. Cool. Um, one piece of advice for um, a photographer who's looking to uh, really go down the kind of the Photoshop route. Where's where's the best place to start? As far as you know, is it going through Elements or is it going through Photoshop? The main the main one itself. Any recommendations? I think um, they're not a full time professional and things really. So I think. I'm yeah. Uh, I mean. 
elements is extremely good these days. Um, there's, there's no denying that. If it's to retouch things for yourself, then elements will do pretty much everything you want. If you're wanting to progress and retouch for other people, then unfortunately there really is only Photoshop to go for. Um, I do use both. Elements confuses me because I don't use it every day, but it does do 90% of what Photoshop does. Brilliant. And that's it, guys. That's our lunchtime done. Uh, thanks so much, Dave, for uh, kind of having your precious lunch hour removed from your stomach as it were <laughs> what's the great the great thing <laughs> what's the great the great thing well i've got photographers actually doing these i'm having my lunch on the side so it's a real great change so thank you uh, for doing that for us dave dave <laughs> thanks thanks very very much uh, indeed with us remember you can uh, find out um, any of any information to do with uh, Dave at his web his website, of course, which is DaveWallPhoto.co.uk. That's D-A-V-E-W-A-L-L-P-H-O-T-O.co.uk with it. Um, as I said, I'll, I'll kind of uh, post a little bit. I think Jay's all, already done it on the Facebook page anyway. Otherwise, uh, get across there and have a little look. Remember, as I said at the beginning, we have moved our, face, our Facebook page now, uh, which is absolutely mad, and I never recommend anybody doing it at all. But uh, again, we do need to get rid of the photo training for you name and so on with it but um, so again it's facebook.com forward slash the photographer academy and just uh, go and like uh, like that we'll kind of just uh, post some bits and kind of following today Dave on behalf of myself and the team and all our members as well as those who are joining us uh, across the world of today kind of thing with it thank you so so much we, we have record, uh, recorded this it will be available on the academy uh, in about seven days so uh, thanks very much indeed thanks Dave speak to you soon and um, yeah th thank you and thanks everyone for listening Cheers now. Bye-bye.